It is 1 p.m. in Damascus. It's 4 a.m. in Aurora, Colorado. I'm Monita Rajpal. This is World One, live from London. President Bashar al-Assad is being offered what could be his last chance to get out while he still can. The Arab League says it is willing to offer Mr. al-Assad and his family safe passage out of Syria if he steps down. But whatever he does, well, dozens of government troops are dying every day in the Syrian conflict. Most hospitals in the Syrian capital are already struggling to cope. But as ITN's Alex Thompson reports, even hospitals are no longer a safe haven. This report now comes from inside Damascus. Syria won't let you film her soldiers when they're alive. ITN's Alex Thompson reporting there, of course, it's very difficult to get the view from uh, within Syria, as we just saw there. A lot of foreign organizations like CNN are not allowed to report from inside the country. So we want to get more now on what is actually happening inside the country. Joining us now from Beirut is Sandra Van Horn, Middle East correspondent uh, with a Dutch public broadcasting company. Sandra, thank you very much for being with us. You were just inside Syria. Give us an idea of what is actually happening in the country. Nobody knows, and for ordinary civilians, that's the biggest problem. As you just heard, people are fleeing for homes one day and trying... A wave of violence has engulfed northeastern Iraq, leaving at least 44 people reported dead. Iraqi officials say the city of Kirkuk was hit by a series of car and roadside bombs. You're watching World One live from London. In the U.S. city of Aurora, Colorado, they gathered to pray for victims and praise the courageous. And power. And love. To the entire community of Aurora, uh, the country is, uh, is thinking of you. Uh, I know that there's going to be a, uh, a vigil. And CNN's Kyung Law brings us more now on Sunday's Day of Reflection in Aurora. The city of Aurora took its first tentative steps in what will be a long road to recovery. The city gathering in a prayer vigil, thousands of people gathering. In well, in just a few hours from now, the man accused of opening fire in that crowded movie theater will appear in court for the first time since Friday's shooting. Joining us now live from Aurora is CNN's Jim Spellman. Jim. Good morning to you, Manita. In about five hours, James Holmes will make his way from the jail here through an underground tunnel. Have police for... released any information during the questioning of uh, Holmes, and is he cooperating with police? He's not cooperating at all. They've said that he, is, he, he won't speak to police, he will not cooperate well, at all. by asking, it probably is too soon to, to talk about it, but is there concern, though, that whether or not he will actually get a, a fair trial when it does go to that? Well, the defense may well uh, bring that up sometimes in cases Someone like that, in like this. Aurora. Well, newspapers in the U.S. have been commenting on this for days now. And Sunday's edition of the Denver Post had this headline, Don't Expect New Gun Laws. It's the divisive issue of gun laws in the United States. And it's a comment piece saying mass shootings can be as much about mental illness and the lack of a community as they are about unrestricted access to weapons. We can see that spending on treatment and screening for mental illness is finally becoming a bipartisan goal. So why not reach a bipartisan consensus on reasonable gun gun laws aimed at curtailing gun violence. The headline in the Washington Times, Fat Man Won't Save You, it's an opinion piece that goes on to say the Aurora mass murder and similar tragedies prove that supervillains exist, but there is no real life Batman who will swoop to the rescue with a fancy gadget and ensure a happy ending. In a culture that increasingly glorifies violence, citizens more than ever need to have the means to exercise their right to self-defense. And finally, the International Herald Tribune has this headline, The Way We Fear Now, and it's an editorial that says, often the most important defense of civilization takes place only after tragedy has struck and innocents have perished. And the real heroes are neither police nor politicians nor an imaginary bat-suited billionaire, but the people who carry one another through the valley of the shadow of death. And you can... Well, in just four days' time, just four days' time, people, the eyes of the world will be on London as it plays host to the 2012 Summer Olympic Games. The event officially kicks off at an opening ceremony Friday evening, London time, and that's when the Olympic torch will be carried into the main stadium to mark the start of the Games. For times of the, the torch relay, a world music festival has been held in London to honor the different cultural influences at the Games. It's all a part of the so-called Cultural Olympiad, which celebrates the history 
history of the all Olympics. And say was Angelique Kidjo, born in Benin in West Africa. She's now a Grammy Award winning musician and a UN campaigner for children's rights. And she joins us now live here in the studio. What an honor it is for us to have you here. Thank it's you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. We saw you performing there. So what was that like for you to be there? Well, great, because the public was in the Olympic spirit, and it just feel like I was lifted up. All right. Well, by we thank you very much for being with us. It's real Thanks pleasure for, having for us me to here. have you on the show. Angela. I'm happy to be that. here. Thank you. You're watching World One, live from You're London. You're CNN, the world's news leader. This is World One, live from London. I'm Monita Rajpal. Iraqi officials say at least 44 people have been killed following a shooting attack and a series of bomb blasts across the northeast of the country this Monday. The city watching the turmoil in Syria closely, not only for the possibility of Syrian refugees crossing the border, but mostly because of concerns over Syria's stockpile of chemical weapons. Just minutes ago, Syria's foreign ministry spokesman talked about that issue. Uh, Affairs reporter Liz Labatt sat down with Israeli President Shimon Peres, who also spoke about Syria's chemical weapons. She joins us now live from Jerusalem with more on what Mr. Peres had to say, Elise. Well, Manita, this is one of the biggest fears about Israel, about the crisis in Syria. That Elise, thank you for that. Elise Labat there reporting to us live from Jerusalem. Well, authorities in Bulgaria are widening their investigation into that suicide bombing of a bus full of Israeli tourists last week. CNN's Atika Schubert is in the Bulgarian capital of Sofia with details on where the investigation is heading. Well, Bulgarian police have widened their investigation to towns closer to the Romanian border. Hotels in the seaside resort of Varna have told CNN that police have approached them, requested their CCTV video. But CNN, Sofia, Bulgaria. Well, despite strong denials from Iran, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu continues to claim that Iranian-backed Hezbollah carried out the suicide attack in Bulgaria. Uh, here, I'm not surmising. I'm giving you something that I know as the Prime Minister of Israel because I know... Netanyahu says the bombing was similar to a botched bombing by a Hezbollah operative in Cyprus earlier this month. So how did and how do Israeli tourists leaving for holiday destinations abroad feel about their security after that bus bombing? We set up a camera at Tel Aviv's Ben Gurion Airport to find out. You're watching World One live from London. Still Welcome ahead, back. the Big Easy, the Big Easy did it the hard way. Ernie Els won the Open Championship on Sunday, and he did it against all odds. Pedro Pinto is here with all the details. I had a hard time saying that. Yeah, I wrote that, so did maybe you? that's why. Uh, maybe that's what it is. Yeah, just poor Doesn't writing. Doesn't flow, Pedro. Big Easy, hard way. I was trying was to good, be though, I trying it. to be smart. It's very smart. All right, the story at Royal Lytham and St Anne's was as much about who won it, Ernie Els, as about who lost it. Because it. I know. Fingers after crossed, it'll stay June, that way. It was horrible. I know. July, horrible. Let's keep it up. I know. It's looking gorgeous. And uh, I'll be joining Amanda on Friday mm. as we kick off our uh, morning, London time morning show. Yeah, uh, from there, the right? From there, from the Olympic yeah. Bureau. It should be great. All right. Thank you you enjoy much. that. I will. You Thank should. You. I should. Thank <laughs> you very much. You're watching World One live from London, underwater city, a deluge of historic proportions. You're watching World One live from London. It is said to be the heaviest rain to hit the Chinese capital in 60 years, a torrential downpour that lasted 10 hours. And as Eunice Yun joins us now from Beijing. And Eunice, you know, those streets that we're seeing there, they're often packed with cars and bicycles, but just sitting under this deluge uh, of water. A lot of people are asking how this could have happened in a city that seems to is often praised for its rapid development. Well, that's right, and the official response uh, really has been uh, quite disappointing for many people. Eunice, thank you for that. Eunice Yoon reporting to us there live from Beijing. We want to see what is actually happening there in Beijing and find out more about these storms hitting the Chinese capital. Let's go to our meteorologist, Mari Ramos, at the World Weather Center with some insight into that. Mari? Uh, yeah, you know, those pictures are really quite spectacular. Um, and Back to you. Mari, thank you. Sure. You're watching World One live from London. I'm Monita Rajpal. Thank you for joining us. We'll update you the news headlines in just a couple of minutes right here on CNN.